across from 1969 to 2003. He is currently the Planetarium Directory, Director at UWL, and he received his BA in Astronomy at the University of South Florida in 1966, his MS in Astronomy at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor in 69, and he did further graduate study at the Department of Astrogeophysics at University of Colorado Boulder in 71 and 72. He's a member of the American Astronomical Society, a fellow member of the Great Lakes Planetarium Association, and fellow member of the International Planetarium Society. And he is the founder of the La Crosse Area Astronomical Society, which began in 1978, and he served as president there from 78 to 2007, and um, treasurer from 2017 until the present. And we're just delighted to have you, Bob, to speak to us this morning on the wonders of the universe. Bob? Okay, it's impolite to wear a hat in church, but uh, this is my business, stars. A friend of mine, friend of mine, Skip Sapansky, he works for T.J. Petersley at the Grand Ballroom and works at Trimple Hotel, used to work at Houghton's and the casino. So bottom line is, when he gave this to me, you, anyone remember the Minnesota North Stars? They moved to Dallas and became the Dallas Stars and still are in hockey. And so I thought this was, he gives things to friends, he will not take any uh, re remission for it. So... Uh, uh, I, for years, thought that's what it was, but finally, there's a Dan Jarecki. I played poker at uh, the Eagles Club on Tuesday night, but Wednesday, champions up by Galesville, Dan, Dan Jarecki, uh, Andy Matchett may know him. Uh, anyway, he said, no, there was a tournament called Stars of Tomorrow, a baseball tournament, and this is what the umpires and uh, people wore. So I'm proud of my hat uh, advertising my business. So first, uh, thank you over all the words that are coming around here that relate to wonder and some other things that came up. So Andy reminded me that I have a lot of, I run into people last night at the Robin's Nest, the uh, fabulous baloney skins had their final concert. And there was a fellow there, recognized me. He was a student of mine in 1979. And he took both of my classes, astronomy one and two, in the early 90s, it went to where they only had two lab sciences instead of three. But number one, he says, I really enjoyed your course and I'm not big headed. I don't go, well, you should have. I, I, I'm just a, a, not a swell headed guy in that sense. So number two, he said, like uh, Andy said, he says, I used to go to your uh, music program. It started as Album Hour in 75, emerged into album encounters in the, the in close encounters of the third kind in the early 80s. So bottom line is I did the Beatles this Friday night revolver. I was going to do a current release from a band called Metric next Friday, but Christy McVie from Fleetwood Mac died, so I'm doing Bear Trees about one of the middle, the third one with her, their fifth or seventh album. And then we finished December 16th with Pink Floyd, Wish You Were Here. We do them several times during the school year. They just fit the Tom Thompson, my assistant here, could tell you. There's just something about the planetarium and or the sky and the music. So enough of the introduction there. Let me start with a couple of quote unquote jokes. Uh, any of you here, I know Deborah Bufton in history, Andy, any other university associated people here? No, that's it, uh, Tom is a, a volunteer assistant for me. So there used to be some, uh, anybody remember a school newspaper in print, The Racket? Uh, you know, it was a, uh, 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 what was it? Uh, Rocks for Jocks, uh, they, it was a uh, school for phys ed teachers and so forth, uh, and people who work at parks. So bottom line is that the, they had something called Rags to the Rackets. And there were two about me, uh, Hans Mayer back there. Oh, gosh. So uh, there were two about me. And in one sense, they could say anything they wanted originally for a few years about anybody, positive, negative, uh, could be a slander. But I want to take this one as a compliment, even though it was a, a, a not meant as such per se, but probably was. First thing was quick and sweet. They say, how does Al uh, Alan talk for an hour without taking a breath? So. <laughs> So I didn't want them to feel they wasted their money. I didn't want, you know, <laughs> I shared my enthusiasm for astronomy with them. So bottom line is the second one's a little bit longer. Uh, Andy, you remember room 100? There's three blackboards in the front of the room, three sections and turned into whiteboards. I like to go into a classroom where there's no class before me. So I can go in at 20 till instead of 10 till to get ready. The fellows before me are women. If they took a little bit after 10 till, 8 till, 7 till, I'd fill the board. 
I had uh, announcements like you have here. I had handouts, some sky stuff, current information or whatever relating to the, the text material. So finally, when I started talking, I would go across, go across the material on the board. When I finished that, the racket thing said, it's a good thing Alan is left-handed because as he goes across the front of the room the second time he's racing, he can write at the same time. <laughs> so so I, Tom, as Tom says, I can't talk without my hands. So now let me go to my notes here. The first thing was jokes, quote unquote, uh, as I say there. Uh, two words came up besides wonder, and even when, uh, thank you Amanda for calling me, the gear started turning as soon as she uh, said what she wanted here. So two words came up besides uh, wonder for me. One of them is miracle. It's a miracle, uh, the whole, the us, the universe, everything. Number two, conceive or conception. So if I can have my first quote, uh, I'm going to say that uh, we think about uh, wh what am I is one question. A second one that comes from that, if you're laying on your back at the cottage up north and uh, look up in the sky and go, what is the universe? So we're going to tie those two together. So here is another Feynman. He was a theoretical physician. There is observationalists and theoreticians in physics and astronomy. In physics, they can go in the lab room and do stuff. Astronomy, you can't touch it and do experiments. You have to gather data that will help you do that. But the bottom line is that uh, Feynman here puts the two together. My two questions, what am I and what or where did the universe come? What is the universe or where did it come from? I, this is short and sweet, dot, 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 a universe of atoms, comma, an atom in the universe. Doesn't that tie those together? So at the end of my pro presentation, maybe have five minutes afterwards if I can, I have about a, I'm not gonna do it now, but an eight or 10 minute segment from a my IMAX movie called Cosmic Voyage. And the history for that is that when I was at Ann Arbor, a teaching assistant, my first two or three years uh, getting a master's degree in the late 60s, John Sinclair, the White Panther, the Yippies, uh, go steal this book, et cetera. Uh, the bottom line was that they had a film library that had a film called Powers of 10. So if you can do YouTube or Google, I do YouTube, Powers of 10. It was an animated film that strictly went a film on a golf course, a couple, one meter away. One second later, you were 10 meters away. Andy, you, you understand exponents, exponential logarithms, et cetera. So after two seconds, you're 10 to the second or 100 meters away. Three seconds, you're 1,000. You go out to the edge of the universe. Well, then you come back into the Earth very quickly and you go into inner space. It connects to me, number one, we're on the Earth, so there's a, Andy, is there a geography and Earth science, right? So geology, the guys that dig the ground the most, the people that dig the ground the most. Uh, so to me, what this cosmic voyage does is it ties together all the natural sciences. <clears throat> Let's start with geography, Earth science, meteorology. You go to uh, astronomy, all the way out to edge universe, but don't you get into something called cosmology, string theory, and astrophysics? So since I got into astronomy in 1964, astronomy and physics have kind of, they always crossed over, but more so today, astrophysics. So let's come back into the Earth. You go into inner space, you're talking about, you're looking at a microscope, so your biology, there's something called microbiology these days, even a separate department. There's chemistry, and then there's atomic and nuclear physics, but you also got the physics out there in the astrophysics. So the point is, it makes those natural sciences be beads on a string. We're on the earth, you leave and you go out and you come back and you go in and you're trying to put those together. So I like to think in terms of astronomy, if you lived a hundred years ago, there was a guy named Edwin Hubble. And in 1929, and not quite a hundred years, he took something called the Andromeda Nebula, was able to resolve individual stars and by using Cepheid variables and intrinsic uh, uh, luminosities of the ones in our galaxy, he found out that thing was two and a half million light years away. Up to that point, we thought our galaxy was the whole universe. And so our galaxy today, the physical part of it, 100,000 light years, you do have dark matter and stuff out there that nobody knows what it is. But the bottom line is that 100 years ago, we could not think about as seriously as we do today, where did the universe come from? Cosmology and the origin and roots of the, the whole universe. So let me go then to my, uh, I said the two words that came up to me were miracle and conceive, both the miracle of how we're here, how the universe is here, how were we conceived. Uh, my dad was in uh, World War II. Uh, uh, he, I was born in 1944. He was already overseas in uh, uh, Normandy, Omaha, he had the balls all the way through it. So some people would ask me as I grew up, uh, well, are you sure he was your dad? Because you know he was overseas when you were born. 
Well, my mother tells me, I grew up in Tampa, Florida. Uh, you have no choice about that to some degree about where you were born. But my mama says, no, I got on the Greyhound bus, went up to Wilmington, North Carolina, where he was training at Fort Bragg to, to ship out. So oh, wonderful to have a father who survived uh, the whole darn uh, thing over there in uh, World War II. So then let's go to two questions. Uh, I guess uh, uh, we have those two questions. And let me have my second quote there then. Uh, I'm going to turn to uh, something that relates very closely today. This is a religious ceremony, quote unquote, without uh, passing the uh, uh, Southern Baptist I grew up. You do the crackers and grape juice. I married a Catholic. I didn't convert. The priest tried to, but she liked to go not weekly, but the old, you know, uh, Palm Sunday and uh, b week before Christmas, etc. Uh, so anyway, it was a semi-practicing Catholic. But the bottom line is, they have real wine and real, uh, I guess, uh, crackers of some sort other than saltines. Uh, my second marriage was to a Lutheran from down by Genoa, Susanna Parish. And she went to Bad Axe Lutheran before there was the split, but her parent, and I liked it that she went to church, uh, but it turns out her, her parents took the kids to church and dropped them and picked them up. So on the one hand, my mother took me. I was raised Southern Baptist. Uh, she was there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night prayer meeting, anytime the doors were open. Uh, a little bit different, the Catholics and the Lutherans, you do what you do. You, you sprinkle them at birth, you baptize them, but you sprinkle them. And then when you get to be eighth grade or so, you go through confirmation, you're confirmed. Well, the Southern Baptists don't do it that way. There's a call at the end of the service that says, uh, do you, number one, if you've already uh, accepted Jesus as your savior and joined the church, if you've backslidden, you can be forgiven of your sins between the time you were, uh, became a Christian and that point. So you can start over the clean slate anytime you want. Well, not really. So bottom line is that at, uh, at age 12, uh, I accepted Christ, and it wasn't any Sunday school teacher or my mother telling me my parents were divorced when I was six, but bottom line is nobody pressured me into doing this. I felt the, uh, the voice of God saying, you do this. I went down, accepted Christ as my Savior, was baptized, dunked. And I was baptized two other times because my mother's second marriage in the middle of eighth grade was to a guy in Detroit. He was in Tampa visiting his uh, brother uh, for 10 days. He knew my mom 10 days when she married him. We moved from Tampa, Florida to Detroit, Michigan, River Rouge, the first suburb of South. So bottom line is that I lasted six months. I had a stepfather that uh, wasn't really a stepfather. I did have a wonderful stepmother several years later. So I've seen both ends of the spectrum. But the bottom line is that I went back to, uh, to Tampa. And so my undergraduate, the University of South Florida, a ring my mother gave me in 1966. But the point is, when I moved back to Tampa, the old uh, Spencer Memorial Baptist Church we went to, I now went to Idlewild. A high school friend talked me into going there, another Southern Baptist Church. Oh, uh, yeah, you dropped your membership at Spencer when you went up north to River Rouge Free Will Baptist Church, almost holy rollers. At least they, they didn't roll in the aisles, but they did. They didn't speak in tongues, but they kind of jumped up and down and ran around. So bottom line is that uh, I wasn't baptized at Ecorse Baptist Free Will Temple, but I was uh, ba baptized again at Idaho Baptist Church. Uh, you've heard of uh, 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 the Tampa Bay uh, coach, Tony Dungy. Uh, he, he goes there. So bottom line is that he, uh, that my church history here, I'm going to get through it. Uh, I had to be baptized a second time when I came back. This would be like a junior in high school. The first time was in the eighth grade. The third time was when uh, I met a woman my first year at Ann Arbor, visiting my mother in Detroit. Her, her, husband, her father was a uh, preacher at, uh, at a Baptist church, but it was not uh, American Baptist, not Southern Baptist. So bottom line is I was dunked a third time by another pastor when I was my first year in Ann Arbor graduate school. So religion is a culture of faith. Science is a culture of doubt. So let me finish up before we do the video with why I ended up with the job that I did. I talked to Andy about this before he started. I was a math major when I started at the University of South Florida. It was in its third year of operation. It was a brand new school at that point. Uh, I started out as a math major. No one in my family had been to college other than an aunt that had been to University of Tampa for one year, a private college, but she met a lawyer and uh, didn't have to finish that. No one had been to college, much less graduated. So I started out as a math major, the more theoretical, oh, the worse my grades got, the less I was thinking about maybe I should look at something else. I looked at physics. It was interesting, but didn't really strike the chord. I went to the Air Force recruiter. I wanted to be a pilot. This was 1964. Ever heard of Vietnam? 
and it was percolating up. They said, well, you need a four-year degree for a pilot, but with two years of college, we can send you to navigation school. And I said, sign me up, offers candidate school and uh, be a, a navigator. Today, they're, they were uh, replaced by GPSs. You don't need them anymore. The sextant shooting altitude and figuring out where you are. So bottom line is that uh, he, I said, sign me up. He said, send me your transcript. I had 58 credits. And he said, no, two years is 60 credits. If he'd winked and said, sign on the line, I would have been an Air Force career officer probably. So bottom line is I looked at, I had, uh, I'd already had underwater ping pong, underwater basket, Ball, uh, basket weaving, underwater tomahawk throwing, Robert's Rules for one credit, Advanced First Aid for one credit. Here was introductory astronomy. Three hours of lecture, two hours of lab for four credits. The lazy side of me says, no, take a two credit course. The practical side says, in the catalog, it says uh, celestial navigation is one of the topics they'll cover in Astronomy One. Well, the fellow that wrote that catalog had only been there three years, didn't get tenure. Uh, the guy that came in, Heinrich Eichern from Austria, astrometer, a practical astronomer, uh, he never mentioned celestial navigation. It's the only course I took the first semester of my junior year, but by the second semester, I was back full time uh, as an astronomy major. Had to take more math and physics than I ever thought I would, but now they were a tool. So finally, to get ready for graduate school, uh, my mom was still in Detroit. That marriage lasted 10 years, 1958, and I, six months later, was back in Tampa living with her parents and, and later my dad. So at the uh, University of Michigan, so what I'm saying here is the job that I ended up with, I'll wrap this up, I did not, as a kid, look up at the sky. I looked up there, but I didn't think about the moon moves, the planets move, here is this constellation, this star name. I did not think about that. I went to school because I was encouraged to do so and got good grades. So when I, I got to the job that I did, ever heard the word serendipity? I guess I did not plan on doing what I did. I just went to graduate school, was a teaching assistant for two of my three years, and got the job here with just a master's degree in 1969. You could get into college teaching without a PhD. Some people that came when I did got ultimatums. You, you get that or you're not going to get tenure. I ran, I'll finish this up by saying I ran into a student last night at the Robin's Nest. Uh, he took my course in 1979, and uh, he said, oh, it was a wonderful course. And again, I'm not swell-headed. I don't say, I'm glad you did. I mean, you should have. No, I'm saying, oh, wow. Well, you know, that's, thank you. So bottom line is that I run into people, uh, former students of mine. I run into people who've been to the planetarium for public programs, for a school group, a scout group, uh, uh, or the music program, strictly entertainment, but to get them in there. And uh, again, as you said, Andy, there's the sky as the background there, even though we're doing all the, the light effects and things. Okay, so if we can go to, uh, I don't know if you can turn the lights down some or not, but uh, there's a video. Uh, the last few words opening here are, it's called uh, uh, Cosmic Voyage. It's an IMAX 52 minute film. I'm gonna take eight or nine minutes out of the uh, early to middle part of it. Uh, I did, did this because when I was in Ann Arbor, the film library had a, a powers of 10 I mentioned earlier. Uh, there was also, that takes you up and out. There's also one called Cosmic Zoom. It starts sideways and comes out sideways and goes out. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a journey from on the Earth out to the far reach of the universe. We're going to come back down to Earth and go into inner space into an atomic collider. So the first day of class, I kind of spun student heads sometimes. I would have our film library, I had them get the film Powers of 10. I would have it at the end of the movie in inner space in the collider. I would run the movie, go through the earth, out the outer part of space, back to the earth, then I would turn it on with the narrator doing it. So the student says, oh, you spun my head around. I want you to be highly impressed, but not totally overwhelmed with my words for what I would tell my students early on in my course. So the fact that I had that film uh, Powers of Ten or Cosmic Zoom that emerged into a small part of uh, the Cosmic Voyage. So let's see if we can run the, the video here and uh, I'll make a few finishing comments and then we'll open up for some questions. Hello? Okay. So I urge you, either YouTube, if you do that, if not Google, uh, it's a 52-minute IMAX movie. There's 36-minute versions that cut out a little stuff, but uh, see the whole thing. It's, it's amazing. So finally, I'm going to finish with a short story, then question. I hope very short. Uh, I'm reminded your uh, video you showed, the child's thing, there are several things that came up, but the one about gravity. 
what is gravity? Why, why is there gravity? We don't know. And we don't mind saying we don't know. There's no, you know, someday somebody may figure it out. I don't know that they will. We don't know whether they will or not. So I was taking my niece, Jessie Parrish, to school and the, uh, pick her up at school. And the moon was up above us as we were heading home. And she says, why doesn't the moon fall down? I'm, I worry sometimes that the moon could fall down on me, gravity. Okay. So I went through, you do this in the introductory astronomy, you, you cover Newton's laws, three laws of motion, and it gets into that. But I say, take a uh, baseball, you throw it. Well, how far can you throw it? Well, well, let's shoot it out of a cannon. Okay. What makes it come back down when you throw it or you shoot the cannon? Gravity. So if you shoot it hard enough, and how do you do that? How do you get enough force, mass times acceleration in physics, to get that thing to go where the earth is, any flat earthers here? I'm sorry. <laughs> to, to go with the curve, it, you're throwing it so that it's going so its curvature matches the curvature of the earth. So now it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, you got to get above the highest mountain, I guess. But after that, it doesn't matter. But your orbital uh, time would depend on how far out you are. So have you ever heard of geosynchronous satellites? 23,000 miles, which means that as the earth rotates every 24 hours, 23 hours and 56 minutes, but 24 hours that the moon, that that object, that satellite stays right over the same place on the earth and therefore in the same uh, coordinates in the sky in astronomical terms. So what I was trying to do was talk about Newton's laws and gravity and that you don't ask, how did the moon get enough acceleration and gravity and force to be able to do that? Where did it come from? How did it get into that? You don't ask that. You just say, Newton's third law of motion. Objects at rest tend to remain at rest. However, there's two qualifications on this. Objects in motion tend to, at, but at a constant speed in the absence of outside forces with no acceleration, just moving velocity. So the point is that you've got geosynchronous satellites, we take them for granted, uh, good old Elon Musk, <laughs> whatever he's doing out there with his Starlink satellites polluting the sky. But the bottom line is that it, it was an excellent opportunity for me not having Jesse in my class as a student to try and explain why the moon doesn't come to her and what gravity is all about. Newton, the 1600s, and where have we come? The way I look at it in astronomy, as I said before, the last 100 years, you wonder the universe. Did you see that structure when we got out to the edge of the universe, all those galaxies? It just be highly impressed, but not totally overwhelmed. You got to finish up somewhere in between there.